Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Raja Jirius. I'm a senior lecturer at Tel Aviv University, a leading uh, group that is uh, doing research in uh, deep learning and uh, signal processing. Um, and I will talk, uh, I will give you today a short survey about recent theoretical developments in uh, deep learning. Now, I am knowing, I, I know that I am, uh, I don't know if I'm using the right term, but I think I'm stepping on X because there are so many works that have been done in this field, so probably I will be missing a lot of them. So if one of the works that I'm missing is yours, so uh, please don't get offended. I will try to give a general survey, but it's a, as all of you know, in deep learning, uh, since the beginning of my talk, another 1,000 papers have been uploaded to archive, so it's a bit hard to track everything. So, as all of you know, deep learning had a great impact uh, since uh, in the last uh, seven years uh, in the ImageNet uh, data set from 25% error in top five. We get today uh, less than 5% uh, error. Uh, in uh, speech till 2000, uh, there was some uh, development in the speech recognition, then till 2000, then there was some kind of plateau and then deep learning entered and there was great improvement. And today we see more and more fields that enjoy uh, the empirical developments that happened in this field. Um, and one of the main questions that is being asked is that all of you, I hope, know that neural networks is not something new. We had the perceptron in the 60s. Uh, we had the neural networks in the 90s that are very similar to all the neural networks that we are using today. And one of the main questions is why uh, neural networks are giving the great results that they are giving. And many people uh, give three uh, main uh, reasons for that. So the first reason that people give that neural networks give very good results is that we have more data, we have larger data sets, more access. So in the 90s, no one would dream to have uh, big data sets like the ImageNet. All of us would have the big uh, floppy disks that uh, barely would uh, carry one image that you uh, take today with your phone. We have today much stronger hardware, so the uh, computa computation power that we have in our phone is stronger than the supercomputers that people used in the 90s. And all these developments allow us today to achieve results that people wouldn't dream about in the 90s and with very similar networks that got uh, average results in the 90s, people are getting today better and better results. And the third reason that people are giving is that maybe we have better regularization like batch norm, like dropout or other things, but all this Three reasons, I think, answer the question of why neural networks are getting good results today and not in the 90s or the 60s, but they don't answer the question of what is so unique in neural networks that currently in uh, numerous benchmarks, the state of the art results are achieved by neural networks and not by other fields that uh, uh, had lots of investment by, in research. And so I think we may answer why neural networks give good results today, but I don't think we have a good, question, good answer to the question of why particularly neural networks have such a good results today and not other techniques. And I think that this is the question that I will focus today in the tutorial and not uh, on the three, first uh, three reasons that I gave. So many times you will hear the first three reasons, but I think the more important question is, is why neural networks and not other techniques that also enjoy larger data, stronger computation, and better regularization techniques. So there are many cutting edge uh, results in many application in neural networks. 
Uh, I will show a few results by my group. So for example, here you may see a result of image denoising by a neural network. So on the right here, you can see result of a previous competitor. Here you can see our result. And what we have done in this work, we took a classifier, combined it with the denoiser. We first put an image in a classifier. The image classified what is the type of this class. And then we put it on a specific denoiser designed for this class. And then you can see that in this case, we can recover the details of the hair and eye in a very nice way. And this was not trained with a gun. So uh, and it get very good uh, results. Another thing that we are doing in my lab in the practical side, so today I will talk about uh, the theoretical parts of deep learning. But as I mentioned, just to give some motivation, I will show some nice uh, pictures or results if you will get bored with the math. Uh, so one thing that we have done is we designed uh, to today uh, you want to take photos with your phone, but many people today want to take also 3D photos. The question is how with just one lens we can get a 3D photo. And we designed a face mask that we, you can add to a, a lens, and then you can get 3D data, 3D information of the scene. And one of the interesting thing in our work is that we designed both the reconstruction, the depth reconstruction network, and the optics itself using a neural network. So we have a neural network that know how to design optics in an automatic way. And it can give us also all in focus imaging. Another work is related to what is called the light field. Uh, I don't know if you know what is light field, but light field is a type of camera that try to capture the whole light field of a scene. So in regular camera, you get just one angle of a scene. In light field, you get many angles of the same scene. And then it helps you in augmented reality, in virtual reality, and in depth reconstruction, and many other problems. One of the disadvantages of a conventional light field imaging is that you need lots of lenses to capture all the angles, or you need to modulate through time, which uh, adds some lat latency or blur or disagreement between uh, or, or sensitivity to moving objects. So what we have done in this work, we added a mask that combined the different angles. And now we have a more recent work that learned this math automatically by network. And then we reconstructed all the angles from this uh, coded mask. And then we also reconstructed depth information. And uh, now we made a startup uh, from this uh, lens. Uh, so I hope you wish us success, or maybe not. But I hope you will succeed. And you will see this uh, lens in your phones. Um, another thing that we have done is uh, together uh, with the Professor Chai Tsuker, we, use the deep, we are using deep learning to try to detect exoplanets. Uh, many times you hear that NASA discover, discover some uh, planets far away. And the, w the common way to discover planets is to understand that planets doesn't emit light, but uh, stars uh, do emit light. And therefore, if you look far away, you cannot see the light that comes from the planet. But you can look at a star and see if in a cyclic way in a periodic way, you see a decrease in the amount of light that comes from a star. You understand that there is a planet rotating around the star. So we use the neural network to try to detect such phenomena. So clearly, in this case, uh, when you have very good SNR, it's very easy to detect the planet. But in cases that you have a very uh, low SNR, you need more sophisticated techniques. And we have shown that using neural network, you may detect uh, faraway planets. Uh, another work that we have done, we try to replace the ISP of a phone. So many times when you take a photo in an image, the optics that you have in the phone is, uh, is very thin. It's much worse than the original optics that you have in conventional cameras. So, and then you need to do lots of operations like the mosaicing, the noising, color correction, gamma correction, uh, brightness correction, and so on and so forth. And then we designed a neural network that tried to do all this process in end-to-end -end fashion, and then we compared uh, the results of uh, the camera, that which is a black box, and we got uh, better results, both with respect to visual quality and other uh, things. Uh, another thing that we, we are doing is uh, working on uh, deep learning on irregular data. 
So this is a, a field that is developing a lot in the recent years. So most of the results that you use in deep learning are on images or uh, on sequential data or on data that is on a certain grid. And one of the challenges is how we apply a neural network on data that is not on a grid. So in one work, we have shown how you can do partial shape alignment. So let's assume that you have with this airplane a template and then we scanned another template uh, template of an airplane then we have just partial uh, scan of this plane and then we want to match it to another template to get the full scan so we use the network that learn how to do this matching so this is one result in another work we learned how to train neural networks on meshes and then we have this uh, this network perform different mesh simplification for different tasks based on the task. So for example, if we want to detect if we have ha uh, handles or not, so the network just collapse everything and just keep the handles. And if we want to understand if we have neck or not, the network collapse everything and keep just the neck or not the neck. So these are things that we have done in the group and many, many other research group in the world are working to get some uh, nice uh, results in neural networks. And one of the uh, nice things uh, that we experience when we work with neural networks is that we get much better results than what we could do or what we can get with conventional methods. So in all the results that I have shown till now, so. Uh, we compared our results to conventional techniques and got much better results. So here, when you, we try to do this classification on meshes with neural networks, we get much better accuracy. Uh, here in the shape alignments, when we compare to ICP or conventional matching techniques, we get much better accuracy. And, but one of the things that disappoint me as a researcher when I do all these works is that we get nice results. We have some intuitions, some thumb rules, why we should do something, some know-how that we have in the community, but we don't really understand why things work so well. So we just take layers, we stack them together. If something don't help, we add a skip connection. If it doesn't help, we try batch norm. If it doesn't help, we try a, another regularization or play with the learning rate. And then after a graduate, a graduate uh, student descent, we get a great result. <laughs> now, the question is whether we may, can find a better systematic way to design things. And I think that understanding the theory behind deep learning is something important. Now, some people may say, no, we don't need that. Today, we have the next stage of neural network. We have the neural architecture search. So for example, this is one uh, work that we have done in collaboration uh, uh, with, so with one of our students and with collaboration with Alibaba. So we, we have, uh, so one of the active research fields today is neural, uh, neural architecture search. So if till today you want to solve a problem, you propose a network structure and train it giving it data. Today you even don't need to design the network you can just let the computer learn by itself what is the best neural network that you need to choose, and it does everything for you. But though we can design networks in automatic ways, and here you can see the results that we have. So uh, conventional network architecture search took maybe uh, 300 uh, GPUs for weeks, which we cannot allow ourselves as a, as a research group in the university. So we designed a technique that we just half a day we can design a neural network that get lower error than other networks that people designed manually. Now, as you can see, the development or the empirical development in neural networks, uh, they evolve uh, very rapidly, but I think that still there is something important to learn or try to understand because I think that it's important as researchers to design things in a more fundamental way, try to understand things, in one of my activities, I'm consulting to a company that is trying to do autonomous driving, and I think that if we, as research group or as a society, want to have autonomous cars, it's important that we will know what's happening in these cars. So if, we, if you take a robot taxi that takes you from one place to another, you want to trust 
the robot taxi and understand what it's doing to sometimes if you just take a regular taxi driving, I'm not sure that you can trust the driver, but maybe uh, we can uh, try to understand what the networks are doing. But one of the interesting things is that when we have a neural network, so basically all what we are doing is we're taking such a simple component, which is applying a linear operation followed by nonlinearity, and this is one layer of a neural network, and then we, if we are not satisfied with the results of this network, we stack two layers together, and if we are not satisfied with it, we stack 20 layers like that together, and then we train it with data, get great results, and then all the neural networks that we have today are basically variation of this simple structure, stacking the same layer again and again and again, we skip connection, with some strides, but basically we are using a very, very simple structure that is gaining straight of the results. And then if we have this linear operation and we're uh, restricted to be convolution, so we say that we have a convolutional neural network and not just a deep neural network. And if we have a uh, feedback, we say that we have a recurrent neural network. And in the nonlinear part, we usually we use very simple operations like the ReLU, which is the maximum between zero and the value the sigmoid, the hyperbolic tangent, and sometimes we apply pooling, which is basically summarization of elements. Now, as you can see, or probably know, all the operations that we are doing are extremely simple. M most of the networks that I have shown use ReLU, which is basically, so basically what we are doing is basically just linear operations followed by maximum, followed by linear operation, and we got results that we don't understand. So what I will try to give today in uh, the time that uh, is left, uh, a sample of the existing theory of deep learning. In the beginning, I will just mention uh, some of the results that exist and other did, and then I will focus on two works that we have done in my group. So when we look at neural networks, so there are many questions that we may ask. One of them is what is so special with the deep neural network structure? Another one is what is the capability of deep neural networks? Are there problems that we cannot solve with them? Uh, so I know that Amit Danieli has lots of works on these uh, things. Uh, another question is how many training samples do we need to train a network? I think that one of the, and I don't know if it's the most important questions, but one of the questions that many people in the industry are interested in is when enough is enough, uh, because uh, when uh, enough data is enough. So labeling data costs a lot of money. Uh, I don't know if, uh, so, so in, in, in the academia, usually we are used to use the commonly available data sets like CIFAR or ImageNet or uh, I forgot the name, but there is a recently published uh, data set uh, by Google with uh, millions of uh, tagged images. And, but in the industry, when a company wants to solve the problem, it needs to pay for the labeling of the data, and this costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the question is, if I'm a medical company and s someone tell me that I need to pay $1,000 for a doctor per hour to label data, it's clear that I want to pay him a limited amount and not have him label data forever. But on the other hand, I want to have, to get the best accuracy that I can to be the leading in the market. So the question is when I need to stop labeling the data. And this is a very important practical question, and, but it's also a very important theoretical question that I don't think that we still know how to answer. Another question, important uh, question is what is the role of the activation function? So why ReLU is better than other things? So maybe it's not better, but we don't know how to use the other things. Uh, another question is what happens to the data throughout the layers? So many use today the attention mechanism to look at the intermediate layers and try to get some conclusions about the data using it. So what can we say about the intermediate layers? Can we use it? Uh, can we do some interesting stuff with that? So we have uh, results on it for detecting adversarial examples, but I will not present it today. I will present something else. Uh, another thing is what is the role of the depth of neural networks? So we know that deeper is better. 
Uh, but the question is why, what is the role of pooling, and so on and so forth. So there are many questions that we may ask about neural networks, and I think that it's important to answer them because each of them has implication on the design of the neural networks, on labeling of data, on selection of architectures, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, we have a summary paper. It's uh, a bit outdated. It's uh, one and a half years ago, but we are working to update it, which is called Mathematics of Deep Learning, that is presenting the main points on the main questions that I have mentioned here, and and the uh, um, and given, I think, I'm not objective about it, I think it's given a nice survey about the theory of a neural network, so if you're interested, you can look at it in archive. Um, but I will briefly now mention some sample of related existing theory. So one of the most uh, famous works on uh, the theory of neural network is the universal approximation theory uh, of neural networks that shown that you may uh, that a neural network can approximate any measurable Borel function. And basically it means that you, you can approximate any function using a neural network. And when this uh, uh, theory was uh, introduced by Hornick and uh, later by Sabenko, uh, it brought, I think, a lot of excitement, but because it says that you can solve everything with a neural network. But one of the things that this theory doesn't tell you is what is the size of the network, how many parameters you need, how you can trade the network. So there, is, there are more things that should be asked about or studied about neural networks. Another uh, line of work looked at the depth of the networks and showed that uh, if you compare a shallow network with a deep network, the number of parameters that you will need with the sh shallower network uh, in order to approximate the deeper network it will be exponential compared to the deeper network. So deeper networks are more efficient with respect to the number of parameters. Uh, now there are works that talk about the generalization error of neural networks that I will, it will, I will uh, survey more in depth in the, uh, afterwards. And uh, some other works that studied the relationship between uh, the local minima that you have in neural networks and the depth of the network. Uh, the group Michael La shows relationship uh, to uh, dictionary learning and there are also uh, relationships between neural networks and the information bottleneck and information theory in general. Uh, some works studied uh, show that neural networks uh, can be uh, studied in relationship between invariance to re of uh, the representation and the tasks that neural networks aim at solving. And there are also lots of works on Bayesian deep learning. So, uh, as I mentioned, so one of the most famous results for neural networks is that is the universal approximation theory that says that you may approximate any function, uh, which is a measurable Borel function, uh, up to uh, any precision that you want. But the problem with this theory is that it doesn't really tell you how you can do that. And also, it doesn't tell you what is the size of the network. Maybe this network should be close to infinite number of parameters, which is not practical. Another uh, work that later followed in the 90s by Baron, and many times we tend to forget that neural networks existed before uh, 2012, uh, which talk about the estimation error of a function by a neural network. And this work showed that uh, the estimation error of a neural network is composed of two terms. The first term is the approximation term, and the second one is the generalization error term. And uh, the first term tells us that we may, the error in the approximation of a function is related to the smoothness of the function and the number of neurons that we have in the network. The more neurons that we have, the easier it is to approximate a function. On the other hand, if the number of neurons increase, then we need more training examples uh, to learn these neurons and therefore uh, the generalization error of the network that we will define afterwards uh, scales as uh, the number of uh, uh, neurons divided by the number of training examples. And we have also a relationship to the dimension that uh, doesn't appear in other works. Uh, there, are, uh, there are other works that talk about the depth of the network as I mentioned. They show that deeper give you something that is more efficient. Uh, now, there are other works that talked about pooling and showed that pooling give you invariance. 
Uh, they, some work showed relationship between pooling and phase retrieval. And another work showed the relationship between a neural network, the representation that neural network give you and sufficient statistics. And the, another work showed that the, uh, the structure of the neural networks can generate representations that are good for learning with a small number of examples. And this is related to some works that studied neural networks with random weights that show that just the architecture itself is enough to get good results. So there is something inherent in the, in the structure of the neural network and uh, that, that give you uh, nice results. Um, Bruna and Mala studied uh, the scattering transforms, which are uh, very similar to neural networks. It's concatenation of wavelets with some modular operations, and they have shown that uh, the cascade of these wavelet uh, transform convolutions uh, give some uh, better, is, the, the deeper you make the concatenation, the more complex and invariant the features that you get, and this gives us some idea on what happens on regular neural networks that we train end to end. Um, so this work showed that more layers create features that can be made invariant to increasingly more complex informations, and therefore we may conjecture that also in neural networks, when we go deeper, we can get this invariance. Um, also, there are lots of works that use the scattering transform asymmetric, and today we also use the latent space of the GAN asymmetric to uh, uh, see, uh, uh, to, to, to compare images. So, for example, you can see here a super resolution using a L2 minimization, and then instead of just using the L2 metric to uh, get good visual results, you can also use other metric spaces to compare images. And this trade off uh, the visual quality with the PSNR or the distortion. And uh, Tomer Michaeli from the Technion with the high blau have shown that there is a trade off between uh, the distortion that you have in image uh, reconstruction in super resolution and the visual quality. So you cannot get both visual quality and low distortion, you need to trade off one with the other. Uh, another works looked at minimization of neural networks. They showed that the local minima in neural networks are not from the global minimum. And uh, they have shown that deeper networks have more local minima, but less saddle points. And other line of works looked at the global optimality. So they studied, uh, they, so for example, the work of Afeli and Vidal that was later followed by other works that have shown that if uh, the neural network obeys some properties, then it is guaranteed to converge to a global minimum. Now, um, so there are many recent works that show that over-parameterized neural networks reach a global minimum, but you need to remember that if you reach a global minimum it, with the given data, it doesn't necessarily mean that you got good results because maybe you overfitted the data, but still, uh, you are not generalizing well. So also in my group, we have some results uh, for theory of neural network that I will uh, go into depth on two of them. So in one work, we have shown that the deep neural network uh, classification is uh, affected by the angles in the data. In another work that I will talk about today, uh, we talked about, a we studied the generalization of neural network. Another work, we studied the relationship between invariance and the generalization in the neural network. Another line of works that, if time will permit, I will talk about today, if not, I will skip, is about what is called the learned ISTA. So, uh, or how we may solve optimization problems with neural networks. So, in traditional signal processing, if you want to solve a certain problem, for example, if you have a noisy image, and we want to denoise it, we want to remove the noise, we define a certain optimization objective and try to minimize it. And then the standard technique to minimize the optimization objective is by certain iterative algorithm. Now, the problem with iterative techniques is that they need lots of iterations to converge. Uh, in 2010, uh, Gregor and Lecun have shown that you may take iterative technique, unfold it, learn the parameters of this, unfolded iterative uh, scheme, and then you get a structure of a network, and if you tr train it end-to-end, -end, 
you can get much faster convergence or you can get to the same result with much less layers compared to the iterative algorithm but with the same complexity. So till uh, two years ago, the reason for why it's working uh, remained elusive and uh, several works uh, provided a possible explanation for this phenomena and one of them is our works that try to explain why we can solve optimization problems with neural networks. Another work, which I will mention today, studied its relationship between uh, the Jacobian of the neural network and its robustness to adversarial examples. Uh, another work, we have shown relationships between neural networks and k-nearest neighbor, and we have shown that it may explain why neural networks are resistant to label noise. Um, we have shown also relationship between equiangular tight frames and dropout, and also in recent work, we have used a lot of information for transfer learning. So this is, so till now it was just a fast survey of existing results. And now I will focus in the remaining time, I will focus just on uh, three topics or maybe only two of them. Um, I will talk about generalization of uh, neural networks and I will talk about it more in depth. And then I will talk uh, about a robustness of neural networks to adversarial attacks, which I think is related to generalization. And if time will permit, I will talk about how you may solve optimization problems with neural network. So I will start with the generalization error. So here I will also promote another uh, survey paper that we have, I have written with uh, my student Daniel Jakubowicz and uh, Miguel Rodriguez from UCL, which is a survey paper about uh, generalization error in deep learning. So it's uh, from maybe two, three months ago. So maybe it's also outdated. But, uh, uh, but I think it, it is, it's up to date, up to uh, two, three months, which give a survey about uh, recent uh, developments in uh, generalization error in neural networks. And if you're interested in this field, so at the end of this survey paper, there is a list of open questions that we think are interesting. So you may look at it and pick one and solve it and save the world. So, uh, for this part, I will use uh, this scheme uh, of a neural network that, in my view, may explain at least partially uh, why neural networks are giving uh, good results. So let's focus at the case that we have just two classes. Um, we have the uh, blue class and the red class. And we, the, each star is a point from the data. The color is the label. And we want to train a neural network to classify this data. And usually, when we use the neural networks, we apply linear operation followed by nonlinearity and so on and so forth. And then at the end of the network, usually we apply softmax or some linear classifier with sigmoid, where, which basically in the two class case corresponds to uh, separating the data with the hyperplane. So if you have just two classes and at the end of the network you just apply linear operation, so basically you're applying a linear classifier at the end of the day, uh, the, at the feature space that the network is calculating. Now, one of the interesting observations that you may, may notice is that this linear separating plane corresponds to a nonlinear uh, separating um, curve in the input space. Now clearly in real data this will be, the input will be high dimensional and this, the output will be also high dimensional, but everything here is 2D just for the sake of clarity. So you may think about what happens in a neural network is that you take the data, you transform it, you transform it to a, another feature space which is linearly separable and then you apply a linear classifier. Now if we compare this process that I described now to uh, classical machine learning, the first part would correspond to the handcrafted features that you take data, you take features uh, that you manually design, and then the second stage will correspond to applying SVM or another uh, classifier. Now, the disadvantage of the old techniques or classical techniques is that you design in them each part separately. So you design the handcrafted features given one criteria. 
And then once you have the features, you train the SVM or the classifier that you have using the final criteria. The the, by the fact that you are doing designing each part uh, separately, you make the final solution suboptimal. Uh, also, in the case that you may, may have solved each of them in an optimal way, the advantage of neural network is that you s design both parts in an end-to-end -end fashion. And because you design both parts in an end-to-end -end fashion, through the optimization is non-convex and not nice uh, and had many problems, many times a suboptimal solution for the whole problem is better than two optimal solutions that are not always optimal for two sub-problems that you afterwards connect together. And I think this is one of the reasons that give the strength to neural networks and I think that it's not something that I think it's a common know-how in the community but I find this figure very helpful to understand what's going on in the network. Okay, so what I will focus now at is the generalization of a neural network. When you train a neural network, you are giving a training set, a set of training examples that are labeled. I'm talking about a supervised classification. And you want to minimize the error on the a training set that you have. And the number of uh, examples that you have, we will denote it by L. Now, it's clear that we are not interested in only in the training examples, but actually what we're interested in is in the test examples that we don't have access to. And the goal is to try to minimize the error on the training example such that the error on the test examples that we don't have access to will be as low as possible so we don't have access to it. Now, to measure what is, the, so the difference between the error that we have on the test set and the error that we have on the train set is called generalization error. If we use more formal terms, so the test error usually is called the expected risk and the training error is called the empirical risk. So in formal terms, the generalization error is the difference between the expected error, which is the training error in practical terms, and the ex empirical error, which is the training error in practical terms. So basically, what we are aiming at is the expected error, which is basically the test error. But in reality, we don't have access to it, so we just train on the uh, using the training set and, uh, and we, we focus at the training error. And the question is how we may use the generalization error. Now notice that reducing the generalization error alo alone is not enough. Because I can give you a random classifier that will give you zero generalization error, but I hope that you understand that random classifier is horrible things to use. Okay. Unless, unless you don't care about the problem that you're solving, and then it's fine. So, um, generalization error is important, but it's important to minimize it along with minimizing the training error. So we want to minimize both the training error and the generalization error, such that at the end, the test error will be as small as possible. Also, we may, use, we may reduce the training error to zero just by have one nearest neighbor classifier which will give us zero training error, but it doesn't generalize well compared to other solutions that we have. So, so I hope that I convinced you that generalization error is an important thing, so, uh, I, so it's important to understand it. So there are many results that looked at the generalization error, like the result of Baron that I've mentioned before. And many regularization techniques were developed to reduce the generalization error. Some results, uh, so um, uh, weight decay uh, is, uh, was uh, proposed which penalized the deep neural network weights. And uh, one of the interesting things is that uh, I've, show, I've been shown is that also when you use uh, stochastic gradient descent, which originally was thought to be just a way to optimize things because we don't have enough resources to store the whole batch in the memory. 
Today we understand that when you optimize with stochastic gradient descent, you also gain some kind of regularization. Another interesting related uh, result from the recent years is that uh, it, it was commonly thought in the community that when you do weight decay, so weight decay is equivalent to a L2 a penalty on the weights. So if you do SGD, uh, if you train a neural network with a stochastic gradient descent, uh, with weight decay, it is indeed equivalent to training neural network with SGD with L2 uh, regularization. But if you are using Adam optimizer or momentum or other uh, optimizers that are related to uh, momentum, so weight decay with Adam is not equivalent to Adam with L2, and there is the Adam W uh, optimizer, I forgot the name of the paper, that shows that uh, if you want to apply weight decay with Adam, so just adding the L2 penalty term is not enough. Now, there are many other organization techniques like dropout, drop connect, batch normalization, and more. And uh, there are many uh, generalization error bounds that were developed uh, for a uh, neural network. So, for example, there is a result by Shalev Schwartz and Ben David that have shown that the generalization of the network scale as the square root of the number of parameters times log L divided by L. And it showed that the more training examples you have, the better generalization error that you, will have, uh, that you get. But on the other hand, the error of the network scales with the number of parameters. Now, uh, this uh, results might uh, sound reasonable to us today because we may think that if we have more parameters in the network, the network will overfit. But today we know that over parameterized networks or networks that, uh, where, where the number of parameters is much larger than the data generalize well. So such results they are nice in theory, but they are less helpful in practice. Another result, uh, which is uh, based on the uh, Rademacher complexity uh, by Ney Shabur, showed that the generalization error is independent of the number of parameters that you have in the network, but uh, is dependent on the product of the Frobenius norm uh, of the weights in the networks, but they have a factor of 2 to the power of the depth of the network. Now, again, today, if you use a, a ResNet and you have 100 layers, you generalize well. But if you will use this bound, you will get to the hundreds of 100, which I think is more than the number of atoms that you have in the universe. And I don't think that you will be able to tag so many examples. Now, uh, Golovich et al. have shown, have uh, refined this bound by uh, Ney Shabur and developed a Rademacher complexity bound that is independent of the depth of the network. And I've shown that indeed, as we practice today, we, the generalization error is bounded by terms that are related to the uh, spectral norm of the weights and the Frobenius norm of the weights, and not on the depth of the network. But still, there is a problem with results that are dependent on the VC dimension or the uh, Rademacher complexity, and it is because the uh, Rademacher complexity and the VC dimension are, in general, are agnostic to the data that you are using, and they focus more on the structure of the network. And uh, Zhang et al. in a seminal paper have shown that you may take the same architecture with the same regularization, and the same architecture will generalize well if the data is well behaved, and will behave horrible if the data is, uh, is random if you look at the test data, but if you will look at the training data, the same network with the same regularization will overfit both the training data of the true data and the data with the random labels. So the, the, the work of uh, Sangeta have shown that you can take random data and train a neural network in it, and the ne neural network get zero training error, but clearly if you have random data, you cannot generalize well, and you will take the same network with the same structure with the same parameters, and you will train it on true data, but then on the true data, you will uh, generalize very well. So in the generalization of the network, we must take into account also the structure of the data, and regularization and generalization bounds that doesn't take into account the structure of the data miss 
something important, I think. Uh, so in this aspect, Neishabur et al. have shown that if uh, you train a neural network on real data, you get that the weights in the neural network are very redundant. So what you can do, you can take a neural network, train it on real data. After you finish the training, you can prune all uh, the you, you can prune weights that are redundant, and then the generalization error bound that you will get will depend on the number of parameters that you have in the network after the pruning and not before the pruning. And then in this case, the uh, the bounds that we have seen that uh, we have seen before that depends on the number of parameters will uh, make sense again because. If I take a network which is trained on random data, then I will not be able to prune it, and then I will get a generalization error which is very high and is not helpful, and indeed scale with the number of parameters. But if I take a neural network that is trained on real data, so after training I can prune the weights, the number of parameters, or the number of actual parameters that I have in the network will be very small, and then the generalization error that we'll get will be very small, and they show very nice matching between the results after compression. Um, another work have shown that if when you train with stochastic gradient descent, so stochastic gradient descent serve as a regularize, regularizer in the training of neural networks. So uh, if you get to a flat minima, it has been shown that SGD improved the generalization. Uh, uh, in, in, in the network. Another work by uh, uh, Brutkus uh, have shown uh, that if you look at two layers, uh, at a neural network with two layers, where uh, under some assumption, they have shown that SGD converge both to the global minima and generalize well. So um, in this work, they connected the optimization in the network and the generalization together and shown that uh, under some assumption on the data, a network may both generalize and get to a very to the global optimum with respect to the objective. And this is important result because it connects both optimization and generalization that are usually not connected to each other. Uh, another work by uh, Daniel Sudri have uh, shown that if you train a neural network with softmax, you can get large margin in neural networks. And as as I will show in a moment a large margin in the neural network learn, uh, lead to a good uh, generalization. So, that, so, as I've so there are many interesting uh, results that give you guarantees of the network. And I think that one of the, uh, <coughs> one of the interesting things that we find these results is that in neural networks, we have a phenomena that is uh, contradictive to the common assumptions uh, of uh, classical models. So in classical models, you have a graph of a complexity of a model versus uh, the generalization of the model. And it is shown that the more complex the model, uh, the worse the generalization you can get. And in neural network, the generalization of the network improves when you increase the number of neurons, but I don't think it contradicts the, uh, the classical understanding that generalization become worse when complexity increase. I just think that the number of neurons in a network is not the, measure of a com is not the correct measure of complexity. So it doesn't invalidate the old graphs, you, but it just means that you cannot replace one axis with the, the number of neurons instead of complexity. Now, in, uh, in our work, we studied the relationship between generalization error and the input margin of the network. So if we will return to the figure, so we, we have shown that the generalization of a network is bounded by the square root of the covering number of the data that we have, divided by square root the number of parameters. So if we look at this bound that we have, you can see that as compared to other bounds, that depends, uh, that, that, that decrease with the number of uh, training examples that you have, also our bound becomes smaller 
when you have more training examples, which is something that you should expect in any generalization error bound that uh, you will see. So you, you would expect that the more data that you have, the smaller the error that you will get. On the other hand, in the denominator in our bound, we have something that is different than all other bounds. We have something that depends both on the structure of the network and the structure of the data. So we have in the bound something that is related to the covering number of the data and covering number with the balls of size gamma. So covering number uh, is the number of balls with radius, with radius gamma that you need to cover a certain set. So the more complex the set is, the larger the covering number that you will need. And the larger the balls that you have, the smaller the covering number that you need, because if you have bigger balls, you need less of them to cover the whole set. And the parameter gamma, which is the size of the ball that we have, is basically the input margin that you have in the network. So if you train a network, and this network have a certain input margin with respect to the data that it was trained on, is the larger the input margin, the better the generalization error you will get in the data. Now, uh, one of the challenges of using this bound practically is that calculating the input margin of a network is an NP-high problem. So you, it's not something that you can really calculate. But fortunately, you can have some lower bound for the input margin of the network. And we derived some e lower bound which connected the input margin of the network to the output margin of the network. And we have shown that the input margin of the network is greater or equal to the output margin of the network divided by the no spectral norm of the Jacobian of the network, which is greater or equal than the uh, output margin divided by the spectral norm of the weights, or the product of the spectral norm of the weights. And then we have another term which is related to the Frobenius norm of the weights. Now we will dwell a bit about on, on the lower bounds that we have. So in our lower bound, so remember, in our bound for the generalization error, we want the input margin to be as large as possible to reduce the generalization error. So what we will do next, we will try to use this bound that we got to train neural networks in a better way that will improve their generalization error. So we want so we cannot cover the complexity of the data, but we can uh, control the size of the input margin. Now, as I said, controlling directly the input margin is something that we cannot do, but we can control the lower bound of the input margin. So if we want to increase the input margin, we will try to increase the lower bound. And in the lower bound, we always have the output margin in the uh, nominator. Now, output margin is something that is easy to maximize. So if you use SVM, you maximize the input margin. And as I mentioned before, uh, Sudri have show, Daniel Sudri have shown that also when you use the softmax loss, you also maximize the output margin. So basically, both when you use hinge loss and when you use softmax, you are maximizing the input margin. So basically, we are maximizing the output margin by the standard training that we are using today. So for adding a regularization, we need to decrease the denominator that we have here. So let's look at the denominator that we, that we have here. If we look at the weakest lower bound, the weakest lower bound has a product of the Frobenius norms of the weights. Now, if you will think about it, re reducing a, the Frobenius norm of the weights is exactly the doing a, or, or, or it's very close to L2 regularization, which is connected to weight decay, which is commonly practiced in neural networks. Now, but the interesting thing that we found is that a better bound than the uh, product of the Frobenius norms is something that is related to the Jacobian of the network. So, um, so our bound suggests that instead of reducing the Frobenius norm of the weights when you train a network, what you should actually do is reduce the Jacobian of the network when you train the network. 
because our bound suggests that uh, the Jacobian give you a tighter approximation for the input margin. So we tested it empirically and we compared the weight decay to our uh, new uh, Jacobian uh, regularization uh, that increase, uh, that, that try to cause large margin. And we tested it on various data sets. Here you may see MNIST, but we tested it on ImageNet and in CIFAR and other things. And in all cases, we have found that using regularization using the Jacobian always give you better results than regularization using weight decay. And the nice thing here is that we have a theoretical result which match the empirical thing that you see in training. And I think that we should aim as community trying to develop more and more theoretical results that give us practical tools that we can use in the training on the networks. Um, and I think that this result tell us that uh, one uh, way to improve a generalization error is increase the margin. Now clearly, Using the Jacobian is not the only way. One of the downsides of the Jacobian is that you need to calculate the Jacobian and penalize it, which increase a bit the training time. Uh, the group of Sami Bengio from Google have uh, recently uh, published a paper that suggests other techniques uh, to increase the uh, margin of the network that improve uh, the training. So. Um, we believe that our bound provide an explanation of or show that theory can guide us to better ways uh, for training of neural networks. Now, in a follow-up work, we studied the relationship between invariance in the data and invariance in the network. And we asked the question of if we have a certain data that is invariant uh, to some transformation for a given task. So for example, if we have classification of a cat, so uh, we want to be invariant to the location of the cat in the image. So let's assume that we have a T transformations that we want to be invariant to. So if we want to be invariant to a rotation by uh, 90 degrees, so T will be four because we want to be invariant to four transformations. We have proven that if you have an invariant classifier, which is invariant uh, by construction to a T transformation, then the generalization error will be better by a factor of square T compared to another classifier, which is not invariant by construction uh, to these transformations. So basically you may, if you have some prior information on the data, you may design your classifier in a way that it will be inherently invariant to these uh, transformations. And I think uh, this, uh, this is used today, so many people today use augmentations to help their classifier to be invariant to the data, but uh, we have seen both in our theoretical results and uh, in a uh, uh, practical empirical uh, experiments that if you take your classifier and make it inherently invariant, you improve. You can improve your results. So, for example, one work uh, which is uh, used the invariant slice, tr they took the input, took several uh, transformation fit, then traded, it, took average of the features, took the output, and have shown that this improved the results. We suggested to do to train uh, the network such that we enforce the features to be the same if we take the same input and apply certain transformations. And many people today use the spatial transformers that also give inherent invariance to the data and in this way improve significantly the performance in the training. So here you can see also the results that we have with our invariance regularization. You can see that it improved the generalization in a significant way. So, uh, so as you can see that Generalization error is a very important topic in neural network, and it's not important only theoretically, but it's something which is very important also practically, and if we gain good understanding of what 
controls the generalization of the network, we may develop new tools that improve the performance in our training of neural networks. The next topic that I will focus at is the robustness of neural networks to adversary examples. So, uh, one of the interesting uh, phenomena that we experience with neural networks is uh, adversary examples. So, uh, you may take an image, let's assume that we take this balloon, you may change a just small number of pixels in it, I don't know if you can see the pixels that we have changed here, and then the network will think that this is red wine. Uh, you can take this harp, and change some pixels here, you can see the changes, and then we, the network will think that this is letter opener. You can take this iPod and then change some pixels, the network will think that it's analog clock, and you can take this armadillo, and then you, the network will think that it's another element, that is a J. Now, this phenomena is universal through all types of neural networks. And it's interesting that researchers found that you may take a variation that fooled one network and it will fool other networks. Uh, you can also fool neural networks by, but by what is called black box attacks. Just you can take neural networks without knowing anything about the structure of the network. Just look at the input and the output and you may still uh, form adversarial attacks. And there are also the uh, poison attack, which you may change several labels in the input labels of the data, and it will change the training completely for uh, certain uh, tasks. So, and adversary examples is something which is extremely important to understand, because, um, so right now I think we uh, look at it as a nice example, but in the future, uh, if a change of small number of example of uh, pixels or things can fool a neural network, if you want to trust neural networks, um, we, we need to understand why these examples happen. So, uh, because otherwise it can uh, lead to dangerous effects. So, think about the future if you will have autonomous cars and some. A, a adversary want to cause accidents to other people, he may just drive in front of the other car with adversarial example. Okay, so maybe the Mossad will do that, kill people with adversarial examples. But, uh, uh, but, but this is something that is really uh, really serious because you don't want small changes that shouldn't disturb a classifier understanding to change decisions that in some cases uh, will be really important. Uh, so, now, as I mentioned, adversarial examples are highly transferable. Uh, they can be transferable from one network to the other. Uh, very little knowledge of the network architecture is necessary to the attack, and uh, there are many, uh, there are several explanations uh, to this phenomena that has been suggestions. For example, uh, so some people view adversarial examples as uh, as the rational numbers among the, the real. So they claim that we, that, that we cannot avoid adversarial examples. So through the measure of the adversarial example is zero compared to the whole data that we have, still we can get to them as the measure of the rational number is zero compared to the real, still we have rational number and we cannot avoid it. Avoid it. Um, other work showed that positively curved decision boundaries are more susceptible to universal adversarial perturbations. And there are other explanations that try to explain why we have adversarial examples. And there are many uh, attack and defense methods that have been uh, proposed to counter the problem. Uh, and defense methods aim at either increasing the robustness of the attack or detecting that an attack has been performed. Today I will talk about 
defense methods and not about detection methods. Th these are two separate things that are studied in adversarial attacks. Some methods try to increase a robustness of, of a network, so it will try to decrease the probability that an attack will succeed. Detection methods just try to understand whether attack happened or not and detect it. Defense method try just to increase the robustness and then the network always gives us a decision. So I will focus on the attack methods through we have a, a work on detection that I will not mention today. Um, now there are many attack methods that try to uh, fool the networks. Among them we may find the fast gradient sign method, uh, the Jacobian best silency map approach, the deep fool, uh, or the Carlini Wagner, which I think is considered to be the strongest uh, method today. And most of them try to go in the space in a way that uh, will make the minimal number of changes to the image, whether in L2 or L1, or uh, to make a change only to a sparse number of pixels, such that the decision of the network will change. And in the defense methods, we may name adversarial training that try to train a network both with real examples and adversarial examples such that the network will know uh, the true label of the adversarial examples. Uh, many people use distillation that uh, surprisingly help a lot to increase the robustness. You take one ne neural network that was trained on the real data and then you don't, and then you distill the information to another network. You just uh, uh, train the, uh, a new network using the logits of the old network, and this improves the performance. Uh, another work is the input gradient regularization or the cross Lipschitz regularization. And we suggested, and what I will talk about today is about the Jacobian regularization, which is a technique that is related to what I've shown before on the generalization error, and I will show that. Jacobian regularization both improve a generalization error, which you have shown, seen before, and it's improved also uh, the robustness of the network to adversarial attack. So, um, so what, what we do, we take a neural network and we regularize the Frobenius norm of the, net, of the network's uh, Jacobians. So we calculate the Jacobian of the network with respect to the input. And we perform it as a post-processing. We regularize the regularization is applied on the already trained network. And this reduces the computational overhead and uh, allow us to use the pre-existing uh, uh, networks. And the reason that uh, this works is that what we have done is we looked at one of the uh, popular attack methods of a neural network, which is called the DeepFool. And we have seen that DeepFool try to uh, minimize, uh, to, to maximize this uh, ratio. It tries to maximize the distance between the output of the network with a perturbated examples to the output of the network to the regular uh, example. So think about X being regular example. X perturbated is a adversarial attack. And then what we want to do in adversarial attack, we want to increase the distance between the output of the network for the regular examples compared to the output of the network with the perturbated example and decrease the distance between the examples at the input before perturbation and after perturbation. So in other words, in the adversarial attack, we want to make a change which is as small as possible and therefore the distance between the example with the perturbation and without the perturbation will be small but still we want the output of the network to distance to be as large as possible. We have shown in our paper that we may bound uh, this ratio by the sum of the Jacobians of the network for the different uh, uh, outputs that they have at the network. And this is bounded by the, Jaco the Frobenius norm of the Jacobian of the, ne of, uh, the network. So we have shown that the term that a neural network is trying, that, that, a, that the term that an adversarial attack is trying to maximize is bounded by the Jacobian of the network. So if this term is bounded by the Jacobian of the network, if we may reduce this term, we will reduce 
the probability that such attacks will succeed. And uh, we tried uh, this technique and compared it to other techniques, and we have shown that uh, if you look at a training of a network with no defense method, you can see that the Jacobian of the network uh, will be relatively large. If you train a network uh, uh, with uh, defense methods, the Jacobian of the network decreases, and it shows that a uh, decrease in the Jacobian of the network improve, improve uh, the robustness. So uh, I will skip some uh, details. So, um, and we compared our method to uh, other techniques. So for example, we compared it to adversarial training, to input gradient regularization, to cross uh, lip sheets regularization. And we have shown that if you use the Jacobian regularization, you always, uh, you get better results in most of the cases. And again, as I mentioned before, also here, better theoretical understanding of the source of uh, the adversarial attack helped us to get better defense technique against adversarial uh, uh, attack. Now clearly, uh, I, I'm not claiming that this is the best technique that exists today. There are better techniques that you may, found, you may find. But uh, compared to similar techniques that use similar computational complexity like our method, we get better results. And this holds because we have better understanding of what's going on. Yes? Yeah, this is here, the deep pool. This is the deep pool. Here you have uh, results on FGSM. And, and here we get better results. Here higher is better. Uh, we get better results with adversarial training. And this is uh, with the JSMA attack. And here we get better results. Now, we didn't compare to distillation. And I think distillation here is better. But distillation is a different. Uh, you need to retrain the network again, and we take a train network and just apply a few steps of post-processing. Now, so we have, a, I think, a good method that improves the uh, robustness of the network. But, but I think my, my key message here is not to use this method, so I will be happy if you will use it, but that if we have better theoretical understanding of uh, what is the source of the problem, and we will try to bound uh, this, and we'll try to understand why it happens, we may get new tools that will give us improved results. So we took the Jacobian regularization, and we have shown also relationship uh, uh, to, to other things in the network. So for example, we have shown that the distance that you need to take to make an attack is uh, upper bounded by one over the Jacobian of the network. And therefore, if we reduce it, we increase the distance that an attack need to take. Uh, we have also shown that it, there is another work that show that uh, if you have high curvature in the decision boundaries of the network, uh, then uh, the network will be uh, more uh, le less robust to adversarial attacks. And there is a very known approximation to the uh, curvature, which is basically the Jacobians uh, transpose the Jacobian. And therefore, if we reduce the Frobenius norm for the Jacobian, which, which is the trace of the Jacobian trace the Jacobian, uh, we basically also reduce the curvature. And therefore, if we reduce the curvature, we also improve the robustness. So uh, our uh, so, so using the Jacobian realization is also related to other theoretical results or theoretical understanding that were developed in the field. Okay. So um, okay. So the last topic that I will talk about is about how we may use deep neural network to solve uh, optimization problems. So. Um, Till now, I've talked about uh, training in neural networks in general, uh, about how, uh, about the generalization error of neural network, about the robustness of neural network to adversarial attacks. And now I will shift a bit to a slightly different topic, and it is inverse problems, neural networks, and how we may accelerate uh, the solution of the several inverse problems 
uh, using neural networks. And I think that this is particularly important when you want to have things working on embedded systems or small systems, but we will take the theoretical aspect of this thing. So uh, in interest problems, um, so I will start now with a few uh, mathematical formulations that are general and not related to neural networks. And then I will talk about how we may solve them using general iterative methods. And then I will show the relationship between these iterative methods and neural networks. And I hope that this relationship will also give us another aspect and understanding of how we can use neural networks better. So let's assume that we are given a measurement x, which is equal to a times z plus noise. z is the unknown variable. a is some measurement matrix. And e is noise. So this can represent many important problems. So for example, z can be an image. A can be subsampling operation. E will be noise. And X will be, in this case, low resolution version of the image. And then the goal is to recover the high resolution version of the image from the low resolution version of the image. So this is just one example. Clearly, this inverse problem represents many important problems that you may find many places. And in classical techniques, the standard recovery technique for almost any inverse problems or linear inverse problem that you may face will be of this form. You will try to uh, minimize the L2 norm between X and AZ uh, such that Z belong to some subspace. So, or you may have the unconstrained form, which is you will minimize the difference between X and AZ plus some uh, regularization on Z, where F uh, is some penalty function on Z that we don't like. So, uh, and so basically almost any regularization any inverse problems that you know, the solution to these inverse problems will have this form. Um, I will just use this to promote another work from a group. In a recent, uh, one month ago, we posted a work on archive uh, with my student Tom Tyrer that I've shown that sometimes you may not use this L2 least squares term. Uh, sometimes it's better to solve this with taking the A conjugate uh, try to, uh, with the A pseudo inverse. So almost all solution to inverse problems or all solvers to inverse problems that you will see will have this form that you have the least squares plus some regularizer. We have shown that if you take the A pseudo inverse and multiply it by X and then you have here just A pseudo inverse AZ which should basically give you a projection. In some cases with low noise, you get better results and much better convergence compared to the case that you use these standard inverse problems. So uh, if you're interested in it, this is not the topic of the tutorial. If you're interested in deep uh, in inverse problems in general, so Google Tom Thierer and you will find this work. Anyway, we will return to this case. Uh, so we have uh, this uh, list. So we, we want to solve this minimization problem that we have the least square part plus the regularization, which is the most common way to solve any of these problems. And uh, one popular uh, penalty function is the L1 uh, penalty function. And it's uh, related to sparsity and compressed sensing. And in statistics, it's, uh, related, it's, uh, it will give you uh, the lasso problem. Uh, so this. Minimization problem is very popular. And the popular technique uh, to solve uh, this uh, minimization problem is using a proximal uh, gradient, uh, which is uh, also known uh, as iterative shrinkage and tra thresholding uh, algorithm. So some people call this uh, proximal uh, gradient. Some people call it ISTA. Use the term that you like more. And basically, what you're, we are doing here if you will look at this minimization problem, it has the least squares term, 
and we have this L1 minimization. So if we will cover this L1 minimization, if we will ignore it for a bit, we can solve the least squares just using gradient descent. So if you will look at the term here in the parentheses, basically what we have here, we have here a gradient step uh, that result from gradient descent apply just on the least squares. Now, if we will just use gradient descent, clearly we will violate this penalty. And to meet this penalty function, we add here a, a, a shrinkage operator, which is related to the L1. And uh, this uh, shrinkage operator, which is in the L1 minimization case called the soft rationing operator, is basically an operation that is very similar to the ReLU. It zeroes everything that is smaller than uh, lambda mu here. And uh, everything that is greater than lambda mu in absolute value, it just decreases lambda mu from it. So basically, to solve this minimization problem, you need just to apply a gradient step followed by a simple point-wide operation, another gradient step, another simple point of operation, and you minimize this objective. And this algorithm is very popular. So, uh, uh, and then if you want, if you look at the reconstruction uh, mean square error as the number of uh, iterations, you get that after 200 iterations or 300 iterations, you minimize uh, the objective, which is very nice. Uh, unless you want to work in real time. And, and, uh, for, and for, uh, for working in real time or for getting the solution uh, faster, you, many acceleration techniques have been proposed to the ISTA algorithm. So uh, the FISTA, the fast ISTA algorithm that is using the Nestrov uh, accelerated gradient has been proposed and many, many other techniques. Uh, because the tutorial is on uh, mathematics of deep learning, I will pick the deep learning solution or acceleration, which I think is the nicest, or I don't know if it's the nicest, but I think it's a very nice one. Um, so we have the ISTA, which as I mentioned before, is taking gradient step and followed by a proximal map. And then we may rewrite the ISTA uh, in the following term. We can take this gradient step and write it as uh, linear operations times z from iteration t plus another linear iteration, a linear operation times the measurement x. Uh, what Gregor and LeCun suggested in uh, 2010 is to replace this linear operation and this linear operation with two other matrices that we will learn, and they learn it in the following way. What they do? Uh, they take the ISTA, they take the final solution after the 1,000 iterations, and then they take this uh, uh, structure, they unfold it. So basically what you have here, we have here applying linear operations, then simple nonlinearity, another linear operation, another nonlinearity. So basically we have here neural network. And if we have a neural network, we can learn the parameters of this neural network. But we need training data, so what will be the training data? We just use the regular ISTA. We will run it for 1,000 iterations. We will take 1 million inputs. We will run ISTA on them 1,000 times. So we have 1 million inputs with 1 million outputs. We will train the weights of the ISTA. And in a magic way, you get that when you run the ISTA on new examples, not the examples that were present in the training, you get the error that you get with ISTA just with 20 layers. But notice that these 20 layers has the same complexity as 20 iterations of ISTA. But with ISTA, you get very high error after 20 iterations. With LISTA, you get very low error. So, uh, as uh, everything in neural networks, when you see it in the first time, it seems very surprising. And the more surprising thing is that this works not just for the L1 model that I have shown. It works almost for any model that you can think of. So Spreichmann, Bronstein, and Sapiro extended it to the analy analysis sparse model, and I've shown uh, examples uh, for speech. Uh, Remes, Litani, and Bronstein, I've shown how they can use it for Poisson noise and uh, with quantization. And they looked at a camera that have just uh, one-bit sensors. 
Thompson, Schlatter, Spreitschmann, and Perlin have shown how this can be used for Eulerian flow. And there are many, many, many other works that have used this concept uh, for many applications. Now, uh, the question is why this works? So, uh, as I said, we can view list as a neural network where basically you have linear operation, you have the nonlinearity where instead of the ReLU, you just have uh, the soft threshold, which looks very similar to the ReLU. Then you have some feedback, so you have here some kind of recurrent neural network. Now, we have this input, we have this uh, soft thresholding, and we have an estimate for Z. Now, what we will do to try to understand why this operation works, we will compare it to another structure which is similar to this, where we can get an acceleration by changing the parameters. And then this comparison will give us some understanding of why we may train these operations and get the acceleration that we get. Now, I will present now our explanation for the list, and at the end I will mention other works that appeared in parallel to us that provide alternative explanations for why lista work. I think that all works together give, uh, I think that all works together complement each other, and each of them give another aspect to the reason of why lista is giving the acceleration that we are seeing. So, Again, if we compare this structure to the ISTA, so in ISTA we just here have here the step size mu, A transpose, identity minus mu, A transpose A. And in ISTA we assume that we have this measurement model, we assume that the norm of this matrix is smaller than one over mu, we also have this soft thresholding, and we are guaranteed that the output that we will get the minimizer for this optimization problem. Now, another algorithm which is slightly different than ISTA is the projected gradient descent, where instead of the proximal map here, we have the a projection operation. And then in the input, we assume just that the input, we assume that the, instead of regularization, we assume that the input belong to a certain set Fz smaller than R. We assume that here we have a projection onto the set uh, gamma. And we assume that at the output, we have an estimate Z where we aim at solving this minimization problem. Um, Oymak, Recht, and Sultano Kotabi provided theory for the PGD algorithm that I've just presented. Uh, I, I will not go at all the details, but they have shown that if A is random, and we have the measurement model that we have mentioned before, then the convergence of this algorithm is, the convergence rate is kappa F rho, uh, where Rho is the supermoon of I minus mu A transpose A times V and U when U and V are in CF. And CF is the, uh, uh, the cone uh, that is related to uh, the function F that we have seen before. Now, you don't need to... And, uh, so all these details are important, but the most important thing for our context is how we may bound this row. They have shown that this row is related to the Gaussian mean widths of the set CF. And this Gaussian mean width uh, is something that is related to the complexity of the data. So if here at the output we have this set is a very complex set, the Gaussian mean width will be very large. If the uh, set here at the input will be very simple, the Gaussian mean width will be very small. And then they have shown that if we look at this Gaussian mean width, if this Gaussian mean width is very large, then rho will be very small and we will get fast convergence. If the Gaussian mean width is very large, then rho will be very large and then the convergence will be very small. So this is the important thing that we need to get from the theorem, which is if the data is complex, we get slow convergence. If the data that we project onto is simple, we get slow convergence. So I repeat, because I think it's important for, to understand what we have done. 
So we have the projected gradient descent, which apply linear operation, then projection, then linear operation, then projection. And then here we are projection, projecting on a certain set. And then uh, OIMAC have shown that if the set that we are making the projection onto is complex in terms of the Gaussian mean width, the convergence will be small. If it's a simple set, the convergence will be fast. Okay, so what we have done, we said, okay, so a very simple way to uh, make the convergence faster is to take a set with smaller Gaussian mean widths. So, so you, you understand that this is uh, something that they could also claim, but we have made another step. So I've said, okay, let's think that this is the set in which the signal exists. Now, the problem in this set is that because this set is complex, you have these spikes in this set, it's very hard to make a projection onto this set. So there are some sets that it's very complicated to make the projection onto. So making a, so if you have an iterative algorithm and the projection is very complicated, it's better to use another algorithm that needs more iteration and have simpler projections. So we want to have a projection which is simpler. So therefore, in general, we would prefer to make iterations with simple projection. But something that we can do is we can, instead of projection, making a projection on the, this set with the spikes, which is very complicated, and because it's very complicated, uh, we cannot do it. We can take an approximate for this set. We can make an approximate projection onto this set. But this approximate projection will give us an error epsilon with respect to the signal that we are trying to reconstruct. So we have a signal that resides on a certain set. We want to estimate the projection onto this set, so we use an inaccurate projection, projection that gives us some error. Then what we have, we have a trade-off. Each iteration that we apply with the, in, so we have the inaccurate PGD, where in each iteration we add some projection P here, which on the one hand allow us to use here simpler projection that give us faster convergence. On the other hand, this projection P <coughs> adds some error epsilon in the approximation. So in the final error, we have a trade-off. On the one hand, we will get faster convergence to the final error because we are, projection, we are using here a projection which is simpler, which has a smaller Gaussian mean width. On the other hand, in the final error that we have here, we have this additional epsilon. We have this additional epsilon because the projection P adds some uh, epsilon approximation in the projection. So we, we have a bound that show that if you use this inaccurate PGD algorithm, then you have convergence, which is of the order of rho p, which rho p is the convergence with the simpler projection. But on the other hand, you have this epsilon term, which is the inaccuracy that you add in the data. So this uh, theory may tell us why you can take a neural network and train it to get acceleration for this type of techniques. You can understand what is the projection that you have here. You can make it simpler. You can make the threshold smaller. But before that, you can add a projection that gives you an inaccuracy. Now, notice the following thing. In the first iterations, we can add big inaccuracy and get fast convergence. When we get close to the error, when we get close to the solution that we want, we can remove these projections and then we don't have this error that we added. So we tested this algorithm on the uh, cases of compressed sensing with trees. And I will, what we have done, we took a model where we assume that we have sparse data that have tree structure. And we made 
a simple assumption. Instead of telling, okay, we want to make a projection onto tree, which is complex, we will just project onto the leaves. And when we make the projection onto the leaves, we just throw some of the information. And when we have seen that if we take the PGD algorithm, which is marked with blue, you get slow convergence. If you take the PGD with the projection on the tree, you get very fast project, uh, convergence, but projection onto tree is something that is very complex. On the other hand, you can take the inaccurate PGD and just project onto one tree level. But if you project just on one tree level, tree level, for example, if we just keep the main node of the tree, we throw most of the information and therefore epsilon will be very large and the, we will converge very fast, but to very large error. So this is not something that we want. If we will keep two tree levels, we will converge fast, also fast, but to a very large error. If we keep more levels of the tree, we will converge fast, and again, we will stop at the place with the error epsilon. And then we have the IPGD with the changing levels. So we say, okay, we start with fast convergence with projection onto only two levels, and then when we go through the iterations, we add more levels, and therefore we allow ourselves to get faster convergence. And we believe that this way may explain why a neural network can get the acceleration that it's getting in the learning because it can learn these inaccuracies because if you just want to, to get to a solution in five iterations, you don't really care to get to the most accurate, so you don't care if you add some inaccuracies in your projection if it gives you faster convergence. So you ha we have a trade-off between the inaccuracy in the projection and the convergence that is due to the set that you are making the projection onto. Now, if we compare uh, the running time, we, we will see that the IPGD with the changing level is faster than the one with the tree. Now, uh, we have made this experiment also with things related to spectral uh, compress sensing, uh, where we have uh, uh, just few spikes in the spectral domain, and uh, we compared PGD with IPGD when we used these inaccurate projections and got much faster convergence. Um, and we have shown this, that this work in many, many applications in spectral compass sensing, uh, in, uh, in super resolution and the other uh, problems. But the important thing for our tutorial today is that if we that uh, this uh, learned, this IPGD, in which we have this projection P in the, in the algorithm, one question is how we design this projection P. So till now I just told you, okay, let's assume that we have this projection P that give us this inaccuracy, and this projection P can give us faster convergence. So our conjecture is that as we can get faster convergence with getting this P, we can also learn this P, and then we get this learned IPGD. So we use this learned IPGD where we just learn here the projection or learn these matrices. And uh, we compare it to the uh, super resolution algorithm by Z data that is uh, based on OMP. And we replaced OMP with this learned IPGD and we got a better construction results uh, and the faster convergence. So, uh, and this is related to the list, I think. Now also, this understanding can lead us to saying, okay, so we don't want also to, don't want only to take our set and approximate it with one uh, group. We can take our set and approximate it with uh, small projections. And this leads us to the Lista mixture model. And we can, and we took a Lista where we use several projections and we, and this give us also a faster convergence in terms of uh, latency. So there are, other works that uh, gave explanations uh, for why LISTA is working. So uh, Joan Bruna uh, have shown that the learning may be, uh, um, the acceleration that we get in learning may be due to a better preconditioning of A. And he uh, studied the relationship between LISTA and the matrix decomposition. Uh, Sinetal have shown a relationship to the restricted isometry property and the drawn conclusion as to the convergence. 
Borgendin and the Schnitzer short connection to approximate message passing, and the Chen et al. and Liu et al. in their Lista paper, they uh, tied some of the weights, uh, the weights in the Lista. The first work of Chen et al. have shown that you can just train one matrix and not the two matrices, and they show this con uh, exponential convergence under some conditions. And Liu et al. have shown that you can just learn the thresholds. But all these works consider only the sparsity case, and our work consider more general case. So if I will summarize, so I think that the take home message from this tutorial is that deep neural networks is getting great results. So this is not the take home message. I, I believe that you know that. But that I think that more that there is a large need to better understand why neural networks are uh, getting the results they are getting and that theoretical results are not things that should be kept only to theory, but sometimes if we get better theoretical understanding of the network, we can develop new, better practical tools. So for example, in the generalization error, so we use our bound to derive a new uh, Jacobian-based uh, regularization technique that improved the input margin of the network and gave better results. And this understanding was later used for other regularization techniques that focus on the margin. Uh, we have shown that we can, the understanding of why neural networks uh, solve optimization problems uh, can give us an, the tools to design new ways to design uh, neural networks for solving these optimization problems and get even faster convergence. And also, if we understand the mechanics that try to fool neural networks, we may design new regularization techniques that will help and improve the robustness. And I think that in general, what I have shown here is just a, a examples and many other works in the community that try to use theory to improve deep learning. And I think that this is a very important thing to do. <laughs>